Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Learn to code at brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. The climate models used by scientists to predict the future of our planet's climate are some of the most complicated bits of code ever written, and they need serious hardware in order to run. Banks upon banks of supercomputing power necessary to complete the calculations. So what if you tried to do it on something a little bit simpler? This is a Raspberry Pi 400 that was very kindly gifted to me by the Raspberry Pi Foundation to use in a video. This is the latest in the line of Raspberry Pi computers, and it's different from the previous ones in that, well, it's a bit more powerful. It actually has a 64-bit processor, it's quad-core, it even supports 4K video playback, so it's... It packs quite a bit of a punch, but most obviously it actually has a keyboard built into the computer. So all you need to do is plug in power and a mouse and a display, there's a HDMI port at the back, and away you go, Th that's the computer. This tiny bundle has everything in it in order to run computer code, which is mind blowing to me. That the, It's a keyboard, the keyboard is a computer. It comes with the operating system preloaded on a micro SD card. Look, that, that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I actually still have my original Raspberry Pi and the box from Maplin, rip. But this is what the original Raspberry Pi was like. There's a, well, there's a rainbow case on it. The actual Raspberry Pi is just the circuit board in this. And the hardware has come quite some distance. This thing only has 512 megabytes of memory. This has four gig and it's a keyboard. But I don't want to run something simple like Doom on this thing. That's way too easy. What if we were to try something a bit more complicated like a climate model? When I was your age, Freddo's was still 10p. All right, Grandad. It's been a long lockdown. Getting code to run on a Raspberry Pi is the simplest thing. I've brought up a text editor, and all I have to do is to write a program in here. Let's do the simplest one possible. So print hello world, and then save this as test.py, py being a Python file. And then all I have to do is just click run. And there you go, it's executed our program. We've got the output hello world. So can we get a program running on the Raspberry Pi that will represent the Earth's climate? Well, the answer to that is definitely yes, because there are lots of different types, lots of different levels of climate model. Fundamentally, all climate models are based on the idea that an amount of energy arrives at the Earth from the sun, and then the Earth emits a certain amount of energy into space via thermal radiation. And there are effectively just lots of different layers of complexity on top of that that allow you to make more and more accurate models. So we can write a simple climate model by taking that idea and boiling it down to its bare components. So what we could do in this file is delete what we have so far, and let's declare a variable called insulation, which is just the fancy name for the amount of energy that the Earth receives from the sun. And let's say that this has a value of 1300. That's roughly the right amount for the sun. So this refers to the amount of energy arriving at every square meter of the Earth per second. So 1300 watts or 1300 joules per second. So how much energy does the Earth receive over a given period of time? Well, let's declare two new variables. We can have time, which we can just use to keep track of how long has elapsed, and then another variable, which, which we could call Earth energy. This will represent the total amount of energy in the Earth's system. The last variable we need is a time increment or time step, which is basically how how long passes within our simulation between the computer calculating how much energy should be added to the system. In this particular case it won't be important, but in other simulations it becomes very important and it's a balancing act of how long you want the program to take to run and how accurate you want the program to be. I'm going to call that variable dt and I'm going to set that to 60. Everything in this program is going to be in standard units, so that means 60 seconds. Now all I need to do is write a little loop. This is while true, which basically means it's going to go forever or until I tell it to stop. And then I just need to simply write earth energy plus equals, so that means it stays the same, but you add whatever is to the right of the plus equals sign to it, insulation times dt, which if you recall is the amount of energy that arrives per second from the sun multiplied by the number of seconds that we're considering at a time in our simulation. And then very similarly, time plus equals dt. And then so we can see what's going on, I'm just going to write a little print statement. So print, in other words, output, time, earth, energy. Hit save, and then hit run. Hmm. 
I don't know about you, but I find that a little bit difficult to work out what's going on. I find it a lot easier to interpret information from a figure or a plot rather than just a stream of numbers. Unfortunately, I'm not an operator in the matrix. So let's add a plot to this, which is actually really simple. We just need to tell the pipe program that we want to import a library. And then I'm just going to write a couple of lines of code, which will allow us to see the output of this in real time. OK, I think this should work. One set bloody Americans. Has to, there's a U in color, damn it. Okay, I think this should work. So here we have a tiny little plot. Sorry, I'm running this on a big monitor, so it's a tiny little plot. And what you're seeing is the amount of energy that is within the Earth system is adding up neatly over time. The further we go into the future, the more energy builds up at a linear rate, which is exactly what we would expect. Also, I didn't label my axes. Let me just fix that. Bad scientist, bad. The more important thing we're missing, however, from this is the energy that leaves the Earth, the other side of that energy balance equation. And that is governed by the really simple black body radiation law. According to that law, the amount of energy that any object at a given temperature emits is proportional to the fourth power of that temperature. And we can write that in the code really easily. Now, this is where things get interesting, because as the Earth absorbs energy from the sun, it's going to warm up. And the warmer the Earth gets, the more energy it will emit into space. And at some point, those two uh, amounts of energy, the amount it receives and the amount it gives out, will be equal to each other and the Earth will be in equilibrium. Except you may notice that we have been looking at energy, not temperature. And I'm not going to go into the thermodynamics of this, but basically those two are related by a physical constant, which is the heat capacity. So first of all, I'm going to rename our variable Earth energy. We don't want to think in terms of energy anymore. We want to think in terms of temperature. I'm also going to define a variable, which let's call heat capacity. And I'm going to set that equal to 1000, which obviously isn't an exact figure, but it's in the right ballpark for the kind of experiment we're doing here. So the amount of energy that comes in from the sun is insulation, and we have to subtract from that the black body radiation. So we're going to call our function, and the temperature that's going to go into that is Earth temperature, except we have to account for the exchange rate between internal energy of a system and the temperature, which is the heat capacity. So dividing this by heat capacity. And with a quick little update to our plotting code, we should see this. Another tiny little pl Hang on, let me, let me fix that. So the Earth's temperature skyrockets from zero, and that's zero Kelvin, by the way, not zero degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit or any other loopy land units you might want to use, from zero Kelvin to just under 400 Kelvin. So that's 120 something degrees Celsius. So this isn't necessarily the most realistic model, but more importantly, we're seeing that equilibrium between the amount of energy that comes in from the sun and the amount of energy that leaves the Earth due to thermal radiation. However, what we're not doing in this experiment is accounting for the Earth's atmosphere, which is obviously the main thing we're interested in when we're running a climate model. To do that, we can write in a little bit of code that represents the temperature of a single slab atmosphere. So that's a single layer that allows short wavelength radiation from the sun to pass through, but absorbs a certain fraction of long wavelength radiation from the Earth. So that represents the greenhouse effect. So adding in a couple of lines of code to represent that, if we hit run now, You'll notice that the program's actually running a bit slower because we're asking it to do a few more calculations with every time step. But you might also notice that the temperature the Earth is equilibrating at is a little bit higher. That's because the atmosphere is trapping heat that would otherwise be lost to space in the Earth's system. And we can dial in how effectively it does this with the emissivity parameter. So if I change this from 0.1 to say 0.5, and that would be a really absorptive atmosphere, so loads of CO2, loads of methane and water vapor in the air, then run the program again. And you can see that the Earth equilibrates originally, but then it heats up the atmosphere, and that warmed up atmosphere then allows for the Earth underneath to heat up that little bit more. So now the equilibrium temperature here is over 400 Kelvin, so that's maybe 150 degrees Celsius. Of course, this is fantastically simplistic because the atmosphere doesn't behave as a single slab, a single entity. It gets thinner the higher you get up. It has different layers in it that behave slightly differently. We can represent that in code using multiple layers of atmosphere and a, for example, a gray radiation scheme, something a bit more complicated than what we're doing at the moment. But even that is still ignoring the elephant in the room, which is that this is all a one dimensional model. We're assuming one point that receives the same amount of sunshine 
all times, and that represents the entire planet. And that's obviously not true. The equator receives more energy from the sun than the poles. The night exists. There are areas of the Earth that receive no radiation from the sun whatsoever when it's nighttime. To represent this, you need a global circulation model, or GCM, which are phenomenally complicated bits of code to represent the global circulation, how wind moves around the entire planet, redistributing heat and moisture and all kinds of things. These are the kinds of models that are used by climate institutes to predict what's going to happen into the future. They're also used by weather agencies to predict what the weather's going to be in the coming weeks. Now, unfortunately, I don't have access to a full GCM like the Met Office or NOAA might use because those are trade secrets. However, there is another source, another GCM. This is Claude, Climate Analysis Using Digital Estimations, a backronym coming from our Discord server's mascot, and this is a GCM that I've been coding for the past several months over on my Twitch streams. By the way, if you have Amazon Prime, you automatically have one free Twitch subscription to give away via Prime Gaming, which doesn't cost you anything and gives me, so, sorry, I mean a Twitch channel, money for free. So I'm just gonna leave this link right here in the description. Claude is designed to be incredibly customizable, so you can specify a custom resolution, whether that's in the horizontal grid, the vertical grid, or even in time. And you can choose any number of parameters, so you could pick a planet with a huge axial tilt, no axial tilt, with a very dim star that it orbits, or a very bright star that it orbits. Or you could change it to be a rapidly spinning planet, or a tidally locked planet. I pop the code onto a memory stick, which you can plug into the back of the Raspberry Pi, and I've got it set up here in the text editor. There are bits of this which are still experimental and are going to slow it down. But with that said, let's see how the Raspberry Pi can deal with this. So for reference, when I'm running this on my computer, these kind of parameters, it will take maybe two seconds to actually do the calculations, perhaps another second on top of that to do the plotting for a given time step. So let's see how um, Let's see how this does. So let's also account for the spin up so we won't load in a save file. So set that to false. And then let's boogie, run. So I've also included little timers in this so it will tell us how long it takes for each time step. And that's, um, it's slower. Let's, let's expand this a bit so we can see what's going on. So, so far it's taking about 2.7 seconds to do the actual radiation. For reference, I'm just gonna run this on my computer now, that would take about 0.6 seconds. But now we're running into the real meat. So now what it's doing is calculating the velocities at given points in the atmosphere and also the direction. So those velocities moving quantities like heat around in the atmosphere. And that's taken about 12 seconds. So this is actually, I'm quite, I'm quite surprised. This is only four, maybe five times slower than my big beefy computer that I edit on, which perhaps indicates that I just need to optimize the code a bit better. Multi-threading, I really need to do multi-threading. But I have to say, it's actually running Claude just fine. I, I, I hadn't done this before this video and one of the things with Claude is that I've written it such that anybody could download it and anybody can run it on their machine. Um, I wasn't entirely sure how effective that would be but it turns out it, you could literally run it on a Raspberry Pi, on a keyboard, on a bloody keyboard. That's quite an amazing piece of kit like to, to be able to right here on this tiny little keyboard, you're running a climate model, like a GCM with advection and convection and a three-dimensional Earth. It's pretty, it's pretty great. I, I thought this thing would be taking off. It doesn't even have fans and I somehow thought it would still be taking off from the desk. 
Of course, Claude is not a full GCM. This is still missing so many facets of the Earth's climate, like the different feedbacks that take place, ice albedo feedback, moisture vapor feedback, clouds, orography. There's so many different aspects that aren't accounted for yet, and we're gonna be adding them over the coming weeks and months over on my Twitch streams. If you wanna catch the development of this live, it's every Wednesday evening, at least for me in the UK, on my Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Dr. Simon Clark. And you can download the code yourself and have a play on my GitHub. There'll be a link in the description to the project. Do bear in mind if you do so that you will need to install some libraries like Scython and it is a work in progress. The model will almost certainly blow up on you within like a day. It's a work in progress. If this all seems interesting to you, but you've never programmed before, there's no better place to learn than the Python course on Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video. Their beautifully illustrated and interactive course on Python takes you from the absolute basics to giving you all the tools necessary to write your own programs. And if you enjoy the introductory course on Python, they have many others in the field of computer science, from the fundamentals of algorithms and data structures to advanced topics such as the workings of search engines and machine learning. Brilliant is all about learning by doing, giving you interactive problems and encouraging you to experiment and learn from your mistakes when you get stuff wrong. It's basically how school should be. Perhaps you're looking at this and thinking this would be a great gift for a student in your life, supporting their learning in school or college. Well, you're in luck. You can gift access to Brilliant Premium with more than 60 high quality educational courses at the link below, or get it as a present for yourself. Either way, the first 200 subscribers to go to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark will get 20% off their subscription and get access to a truly brilliant educational resource. Thank you for watching the video. And of course, thank you so much to the Raspberry Pi Foundation for sending me this amazing piece of kit. Again, I am astonished that it ran the code as well as it did. If you have any suggestions for what I could do with this bit of kit next, then do let me know, because I'd, I'd love to play around with this thing more. Also, if you'd like to see the grandpappy, the original Raspberry Pi try and run Claude, then let me know. And I think that could be arranged in a future video. If you would like to see more of Claude, then do check out those Twitch streams and you can download the code yourself at the GitHub repository link in the description. If you enjoyed the video, then please do pop it a like, share it with your friends. You're a grown adult. You probably know what you're doing by this point. Actually, who am I kidding? I don't. Here's some suggested viewing next. And if you enjoyed the video and you're not already, then you know, you can subscribe to the channel. That'd be nice. Anyway, thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.